Hi, I'm Gary Rubenstein, and I'm going to take you through the Algebra 2 Trigonometry uh, New York State Regions that was administered uh, June 15, 2010. Now, the ideal way for you to uh, watch this video is to first do the test yourself, which you can get for free online. You go to www.nysedregions.org, and you go down to uh, Algebra 2 Trigonometry, and click here, June 2010, and click here to download the uh, examination, and you can get the scoring key and um, explanation of how, to, how they graded it and the scaling. But the main thing is that you get the, the test itself. And I'd recommend that you do that and that you do this entire test if you have time. If you don't have time, you just kind of watch and, and uh, follow along. So let's just go through it one question at a time, beginning with question number one. Uh, the part ones are worth uh, two points each. There's no partial credit on these part ones, so you want to be extra careful uh, that you don't make a careless mistake and lose you know, full, full credit. The first question says, what's the common difference of the arithmetic sequence 5, 8, 11, 14? So an arithmetic sequence is a, is a number pattern. So 5, 8, 11, 14. Basically what they're getting at is, let's say they wanted to know what the next number was. You would look to see, is there a pattern? And in this case, uh, the first number is 5, the second one's 8. So it's 3 different, plus 3 to get from first term to second. 8 to 11 is plus 3. 11 to 14 is plus 3. Well, that plus 3 is what's known as the common difference. The next number would be 17 if they asked for it. If you could figure out the next number in that pattern, then you also know what the common difference is, even if you didn't realize that's what it was called. Answer number one is choice three. Question number two. Two says, what is the number of degrees in an angle whose radian measure is 11 pi over 12? Well, there's two ways to measure angles. The most uh, familiar way is in, uh, in degrees, for instance, a right angle, we could say, is uh, 90 degrees. But there is a second way that they've invented to, uh, to measure angles, and it's using something called radians. Um, a radian is an angle that's about 57 degrees, approximately. Um, the conversion from radians degree to degrees is this. Pi radians is 180 degrees. That's the fact that you have to know. One radian is about 57 degrees. In case you're wondering officially what a radian is, it's the angle so that the arc over here is equal to the, uh, to the radius. And it's about 57 degrees. It ends up being uh, one radian is actually uh, 180 over pi degrees, which is about 57. You don't need to really know that for the regions. All you really need to know is this, that pi radians is 180 degrees. So then we can say if pi radians is 180 degrees, what's 11 pi over 12 radians equal to? So I set up a proportion here, pi over 180 equals 11 pi over 12 over x. Notice that uh, 11 over 12 is pretty close to uh, pretty close to 1, a little bit less. Anyway, so the answer is going to be a little bit less than 180. I already know it's going to be either 1 or 2, but let's just do it the official way. If you cross multiply this proportion, you would get pi x equals 180 times 11 pi over 12. Now you can cancel the 180 and the 12 to get 15. You can divide both sides by pi, and you get your answer, x equals 165 degrees. So for approximation purposes, um, you could know that pi radians is 180 degrees, and that would actually help you estimate this uh, pretty well. Otherwise, you can do this thing with the proportions. Incidentally, a 90 degree angle 
in radians is actually pi over 2 radians. And in case you're wondering, um, that's related to the fact that if the radius was 1, the entire circumference of the circle would be 2 pi r, which is 2 pi times 1, which is 2 pi. And this arc here would be pi over 2. The length of it would be pi over 2. It would be 1 fourth of the whole circle. And that's also the radian measure. But you don't need any of that for this question. Just the fact that pi over 180 is number of radians over number of degrees. And fill in the one that's known to you and calculate out the other one. Question number three. If A equals 3 and B equals negative 2, what is the value of the expression A to the negative 2 over B to the negative 3? <clears throat> well, easiest way to do this question is to, is to know that when you raise something like, like 2 to the negative 1 power, that's the same thing as 1 over 2 to the first power. That's what you do with negative exponents. And 2 to the negative 2 power is 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 fourth. Hmm. So, um, in general, this a to the negative 2 is the same thing as 1 over a squared. And b to the negative 3 is the same thing as 1 over b to the third. Now you divide fractions by flipping the bottom one and multiplying. So you get 1 over a squared times b cubed over 1, which becomes b cubed over a squared. Hold on a second. For some reason my eraser isn't working. Anyway, <clears throat> to continue this question, b cubed, since b is negative 2, b cubed is negative 8. Whereas a squared a is, uh, a is uh, 3, so a squared is 9, which is why the answer to this question is negative 8 over 9. Okay, well, I don't know why my eraser is not working, but I'll continue just like you should when you uh, get the real test. Question 4. Four points on the graph of the function are, are uh, described here. 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 8. And they want to know what equation represents f of x. If you have a, an equation like f of x equals 2x, let's say, that's, that's, a, that's an example of a function, um, that tells you how to turn an x value into uh, the function value for that number. So for instance, if f of x equals 2x, f of 3 equals 2 times 3, which is 6. That's how this function notation works. The solution, uh, or, or the, the ordered pairs that satisfy this function can be listed in a set. So like 2x has 0, 0 is one of the numbers, and 1, 2 is one of the ordered pairs, sorry, and 2, 4, and 3, 6. So these would be the, some ordered pairs that, um, these are some ordered pairs that fit with this f of x equals 2x function. Well, this can work in the other direction also. They can give you the list and ask you to figure out what the, what the function was. And you can do this by just testing the answer choices. So does 2 to the x work? Well, when x is 0, 2 to the 0 is 1. So that seems to work. But check the other choices also. 2 to the 1 is 2, so that works also. You see, the, the 1 is the x value, and the 2 is what comes out after you run it through the function. 2 to the second is 4. So that point works. And 2 to the third power does equal 8. So 3, 8 would be a point for that function. And that's why this answer is choice 1. Number 5. <clears throat> the graph y equals f of x is shown below. So you've got this. Uh, this is a graph of a function. Just like in this last example, you could describe a function with a list of ordered pairs. Or you can, if you were to graph these points for the y, f of x equals 2x, they would make a nice some kind of line here, the slope of 2. So by giving us a, a graph, we may not know, know what the function is, very complicated function, but we know some things about it. So they want to know 
a uh, couple of things they could ask when they give you a graph like this. They could ask, for example, what is f of 1? To get that, you would go over to 1 on the x value and see how high up the y value is, which seems to be at about, uh, well, it's about negative 6, because this is a 2, negative 2, 4, 6. Notice the 10, the scale is a little different. Anyway, another question they could ask is this. When is f of x equal to 0? That's not the same as saying what's f of 0. f of 0 equals 0 because of this point here, but that's not what this is asking. They want to know, are there any other x values that would give me a y value of 0? Well, I see 3 here, here, and here. These are the three points that have a y value of 0, and their x values are uh, 3, 0, and minus 2. And that's why the answer to this question is choice 4. Moving on to uh, question number six. In simplest form, the square root of negative 300 is equivalent to. <clears throat> well, there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, the square root of 300, what you want to do with to simplify square roots is to try to break up that 300 into two numbers uh, where one is a perfect square, and preferably a big perfect square. So for instance, 300 is 100 times 3. The perfect squares come from the list, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, 7 squared, 8 squared, 9 squared, and so on. So 100 is the biggest number on that list that goes into 300. Well, then you can split this up into root square root of 100 times square root of 3, which becomes 10 root 3. But that's not what the question was. They had this negative sign here. Well, when you have a negative sign, you can, uh, since the square root of negative 1 is defined as imaginary number i, we can bring that negative sign out as an i right, right in the beginning of the problem. Uh, traditionally, they put the i in between the 10 and the square root of 3. That's why the answer is choice 3. <clears throat> number 7. 20 different cameras will be assigned to several boxes. Three cameras will be randomly selected and assigned to box A. Which expression can be used to calculate the number of ways? Well, this gets to the heart of what's the difference between a combination and a permutation. A permutation is if you were taking three things out of 20 and you had to put them in a certain order. I like to think of it as if there were like 20 ice cream flavors and you were to make a cone the flavors that you use, you know, 1, 4, and 7, would be different than if you used flavors 1, 7, and 4. So that, that for, for ice cream cones, for instance, it would be a 20P3. But this is a combination because it doesn't matter. But we're taking uh, three cameras out of 20 and putting them in a box, and we're not even going to know what order they were put in. It doesn't matter. That's, to me, kind of like if you're putting ice cream into a cone, into a cup, sorry, where flavors 1, 4, and 7. It didn't matter what order they went in. That's why this one is choice 3. If you see, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell if order matters or not. If you see the word committee, that would be an example where order doesn't matter, but this doesn't have the word committee, but you have to kind of decide for yourself if order matters or not. In this case, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Question number 8. They want us to factor 12x to the 4th plus 10x to the 3rd minus 12x squared. Well, the first type of factoring you should always look for is greatest common factor. Notice how all the terms are even, so 2 goes into them, and they all have x's in them, and in fact they all have, since x squared is the smallest exponent you see, we can factor out an x squared. We're left with 6x squared plus 5x minus 6. Now this thing is kind of quite annoying to, uh, to factor, if there's a 6 out here and a 6 there. What you could do is just check the different answer choices. Just uh, notice that these two are the most promising. If you were to just multiply out these two answers to see which one was the proper factor, you get the answer pretty quickly. If you FOIL out 2x plus 3 and 3x minus 2, this is this choice 4, you do get 6x squared you get minus 4x plus 9x, which is plus 5x like we want, minus 6. That's why that's the answer for number 8.